almost 50 years, I've come to appreciate the tremendous diversity of gifting and graces in God's people and learned a good while ago now that my primary task is to equip others for their works of service. And in that process, we have all kinds of people doing all kinds of things at our Father's house simply because we make room for the gift that's in you. And one of the most extraordinary gifts in our entire preaching ensemble is one of my favorites who has the pulpit today. Would you please rise and welcome our own Hilton Garcia. appreciate the, <clears throat> the video and the message of the gospel reaching out. I uh, appreciate it that once the gospel is preached and believed, you become part of the family, and the family comes to your help when you need it. That's, that's really comforting to know that it isn't just about a religious activity. It's about gaining a family forever. Amen. Amen. And the people you have yet to meet and know that you will know. So amen. I'm excited about this today. I'm going to be reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 25, verse 8. I still don't know how to dress. Thank you, Daddy. Jesus loved dads and take care of you. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> Amen. So I'm reading from Genesis chapter 25, verse 8. And it says, Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Now, some of you may or may not remember the last time I was with you on Father's Day, I preached on Father Abraham and I used this very same verse. And on that particular message, we concentrated on the word full of years. This is not part two. This is just another message using the very same verse because I found this so interesting that things just kept coming out of it. So you bear with me. But today, I want to concentrate on the phrase gathered to his people. And if we were just kind of skimming through the Bible really quick, like when we read and we get to this verse and we read about Abraham, the, the quickest thing that we can get to, to our mind is just, well, they're just talking about his death. I mean, he died. He was buried. He was gathered to his fathers. Ta-da! Move on to the next verse because there's something more exciting coming. But if we take a moment to pause and think about this phrase, gathered to his people, we'll find, out, we'll find some interesting things about this little phrase. For example... This phrase is only used of Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, Aaron, and Moses. There are other phrases gathered to his fathers that's used through the scripture. But in particular, this particular phrase is only of these guys. Now, if, if we were going to accept the idea that all we're talking about is that Abraham was buried in a family plot. Make sense? Or that Abraham 
just simply was buried. And that's the end of it. Then, then we would have to consider some other issues with this particular phrase. For, for example, the order in which the words come in. He died, he was buried, and gathered to his people. Whereas if he was gathered to his people or his family, then it would be he died, was gathered, and buried. But, but that's not the order. So that gives us a hint that there's something else going on in here. The other problem we have is that in the case of Abraham, Aaron, and Moses, they were not buried in a family plot. They were not buried anywhere near their fathers. As a matter of fact, God buried Moses himself. And the scripture says that no one to this day knows where. He simply said, Moses, come here. And he buried him himself. He loved him that much that he would not let anybody else touch his body. So obviously, Moses was not buried in a family plot, nor was he given over to his family or to his fathers. Also, we need to consider Jacob. Wow. Jacob was gathered to his people a long time after he was buried. So that's kind of odd. So there, there's something else going in here, and we need to take a pause, and we need to look. This phrase, gathered to his people, speaks about the belief of the Hebrews that there is indeed life after death. Now this is important, because as we understand it, you die and all that, and it's done, but it's not. The Hebrews believed that your physical body would die and then you will go somewhere where you are immortal. Now, I'm going to read a verse, but before I do, I, I don't want you guys rushing the altar, grabbing me, taking me outside, and stringing me for this, okay? But... There are books, I, I grew up as a Catholic, okay? And so as a Catholic, there are additional books that they put into scripture. Now, the, the, the Protestant faith has, has rejected those books and you won't find them in, in the Protestant Bibles, but the Catholics keep them in there. And if you're doing some kind of study, one of the things we need to understand is that these books are valuable for understanding the mindset of the Hebrew people. So, so with that in mind, when I read this to you, I, I'm reading it to you so that you would understand that there is a historical background for what I'm talking about. Can we amen that? Okay, thanks. Whew. <laughs> okay, so I'm reading out of the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 23. And it says, For God created man to be immortal and made him to be an image of his own eternity. So, so you see, the first thing that comes into play is that the Hebrew people believe that man was made immortal so that we would live forever. And that's really important because upon your physical death, where do you go? You go to a place called Shival. This place is described in the scriptures as a place of silence where you're not allowed to speak. It's also described as a place of shades. It's also described as a place of darkness. More important, this place is also divided. On one side, it's called paradise, 
or the other common term is Abraham's bosom. And in this place is where the righteous go. Now, Jesus made mention of this place when he was up on the cross and he's talking to the thief and he tells him, this day you will be with me in paradise. Remember that? Okay, there are other scriptures that talk about the same place. But the idea is that in Shalom, there is a place where the righteous are kept. And then there's a place called Tartarus, where the wicked go. Now, as time went on, and the Hebrews were understanding this particular concept, it became their goal that when they pass on, they would end up in this place called paradise. And so, they had to learn how they had to live to be able to obtain this place called paradise. But death as a whole was not really looked at as something bad. It was simply looked at a stepping stone to later because the Hebrews believed that someday death itself would be overcome. And we see that in Isaiah 26, 19. Where it says, Your dead shall live, their body shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for you do as a dew of light, and the light of earth will give birth to the dead. Followed by... That's what I get for not writing all my verses down. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54, it makes it clear that death itself would be swallowed up. And so they lived in this place with the expectation that death will be done away with and that there would be a resurrection of the dead where the dead will live again. However, it also made it clear that when this resurrection took place, everyone would have to stand before the throne of God and be judged. That could not be escaped. And it wasn't until Jesus came on the scene that he talked more about these afterlife, this place called hell, this place called heaven. Jesus spoke more about hell than everything you could find in the Old Testament. Jesus described it as a place of fiery furnace. He also described it that it would be a place where he would gather everyone and those that were wicked would be tossed into the fire and the other ones would be given life. These are straight out of Jesus' mouth. He spoke more about this than anybody. Now, I, I don't want anyone to think I'm going to be judgmental in, these, in this statement that I'm going to say. Because that is not my goal. But I don't care what tense I use with the word sin. Whether I have sinned, I will sin, I'll continue to sin. It doesn't matter because all have sinned. And because all have sinned, all deserve death. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death. And that is something that cannot be escaped. And once you die and you end up in this place, Shaval, in these two places, there is a story in Scripture in Luke chapter 16 where Jesus is talking about the rich man and the, and the beggar um, 
who died, and the beggar ends up next to Abraham in Abraham's bosom, and the rich man ends up in a place of torment. And in this particular case, Abraham is a spokesman for paradise. And he tells the guy, the chasm between you and I are so great that it is impossible to cross. So if you end up in one place or the other, it is impossible to then switch once you end up there. Now, in regard to this thing called sin, it doesn't matter what tense you want to put it on. As a matter of fact, it doesn't matter who you are. I'm going to say Christian and non-Christian alike sin, have sin, will sin, and continue to sin. Then there is no escaping that. And if you are a non-Christian and you're looking at the Christian and the Christian sins, you've got to say to yourself, what a hypocrite. And he probably is right. Because sin is something that the Christian struggles with. Even when you don't want to, even when you're not looking towards it, sin appears and you find yourself going, dang it. And you know it. What makes you different? Why should God have favor upon you, you who sin just like the non-believer? Why? There is absolutely no reason for God to have any mercy upon you. There is absolutely no reason for God to accept you because of your sin. I don't know how often I look at myself and all I see is sin around me. And I say, God, how is it possible that you can still love me? How is it possible that you can still forgive me? How is it possible that you tell me that I will see eternal life? How is it possible when I am such a wreck? And he whispers to me, because you believed in me. You believed that I shed my blood for you on the cross. You believe that after I died and rose again, that was your indication that you would never see death because I live. You can be assured that I will keep my word. I love you and I died for you and you will be delivered because you believe. He said, it's like this. He took your sin from the past. He took your sin from the present. He took your sin for the future. He took your sin that you're hiding and don't want anybody to know about. And because you sinned, death took advantage of this and say, you're mine. Your sin validates me bringing you to death and keeping you. But Jesus shed his blood on the cross for you. So that the Father would not see your sin. And finding all this in love, 
so that it could not be undone. And he took this whole mess and he threw it as far as the east is from the west. is no longer held against you. But to those that do not believe, understand that you are without excuse. Without excuse, because he has already died for you, shed his blood for you, resurrected from the dead for you. He has done all this for you, that you may live. And by rejecting him, you still live in your sin. And because you live in your sin, death will swallow you up. And his blood has no effect on you. So Christians, endure. Christians understand <laughs> I love this. <clears throat> Christians, understand that your life is constantly under opposition. Understand that you are constantly ridiculed. Understand that you are constantly scuffed. And that should not surprise you. Remember, last time we talked, we looked at Genesis 10, 11, and 12. In Genesis 10, there was a list of nations, and there were 70 of them. In Genesis 11, we see the Tower of Babel, the story. And then in Genesis 12, it begins with the call of Abraham to God. What was that all about? That was about a rebellion of mankind towards God. Seventy nations gathered, rebelled against God, and God said, fine. I tell you what, you don't want me as your God? Fine, I will not be your God. And the people said, we don't want you. We want those gods. And so the other gods, the other powers and principalities in heaven said, see, they don't want you. They want us. And God said, fine, you can have them. And he turned them loose. But he said, I'm keeping one nation. So immediately, you see the odds are 70 to 1 for Israel. You think it was easy for them to exist with these laws that God gave them, these strict commandments, these, the, these ways of acting and, 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 and living? I mean, even, even the simple things. He says, I don't want you to do anything like those other people. I want you to be different. I don't want you to look at the the moon, the sun. I don't want you to make any images. I don't want you to do anything that represents what they're doing. I don't want you to cut yourself like they cut yourself. I don't want you to wear tattoos. I'm not talking, just mentioning what Scripture says. It's the New Testament. Forgiveness. But you see the idea, right? The idea is that God wanted them to be different. And when they become different, they're up against ridicule by all the other nations. And some of the Israelites began to say, I, I want to be cool like those guys. And so they would stray from God and go off to be cool. Christians, you don't have to be cool. You can still be cool where you're at without following the things 
outside of what God wants you to be. But you are against an opposition. You are against different odds because all around you are constant attacks coming your way to try to get you to sway. And whenever you make a mistake and sin, really quickly, all you have to do is look at the news. The first time they catch any Christian in a sin, it becomes news. Now, are you going to love this? I loved it. <laughs> love it. God said, you're free to go, but I'm coming back. You're, you're free to go do your own stuff, but I'm coming back. When we look at the book of Acts, one of the things that we, 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 we notice is that at Pentecost, they, the scripture says that there were Jews from all over the world. All over the known world. And as it turns out, all over the known world was the same world that existed at the revelation of the Tower of Babel. So you had at Pentecost the same 70 nations represented. The same 70 nations heard Peter's sermon, heard the fall of Pentecost upon the Christians. And once they heard this sermon, God was world on notice. I'm coming back and I'm freeing the people because you can't hold them anymore. And he started to send out messengers. And the messengers went out to the four corners of the world with the gospel. And all who believed all who believe were free. All that believe now had their sins forgiven. All that believe could now walk in power of Christ. All that believe could be and would be Christians. To the four corners of the world. Today, by radio, we're still reaching out. Because God is determined that the earth... And everybody in it is his. Doesn't belong to the powers and principalities. Doesn't belong to you. From the very beginning, he created you an immortal person to work with him, to be with him, to take care of this earth and live here with him in harmony. And his plan will not be detained. His plan cannot be held back. His plan is going to get fulfilled. And acts was the warning message to the world. I'm coming. I'm coming and you can't stop me. That's why we need to understand that a gathering is coming. And this gathering will include every single person that ever existed. And in this gathering, there will be a judgment. And in this judgment, those that are found, that are still with their sin, will be cast in to the fiery furnace. Jesus' words, not mine. But understand that they have the power for that. So, gathering to his people speaks about an afterlife not just in the depths but an afterlife after it's all done an afterlife that includes eternity with the father amen amen now next week is encounter sunday and, and I thought maybe as an encouragement to you, I, I would like to tell you a couple of quick stories. Okay, A number of years ago, 
You know, when you use the typewriter a lot on the computer, what happens to your wrist? Yeah, I had it really bad in both hands. And you know, and I still had to put out the reports and the test plans and everything. It was bad. And I was at a church meeting, and I can't quite remember, but I was sitting in the audience, and there was a lot of fun stuff going up in the front. And I said, God, can you take care of this for me? See, that's how I pray to God. I, I don't have the big, ooh, prayers. I, I just talked to him. And I stood up, and I raised up both my hands to the sky to praise him. And as I did that, there was a, a ceiling or a substance in the air. I, I felt like I was putting my hands in a a, a a bucket of water because as I put my hands up you see where my little wrists and the, um, my bands are it stopped about there on both hands and as I did that he, he healed me of my wrist and and that was over 15 years ago I I used to have nasty heartburn I mean I didn't even have to eat I can just look at food and get heartburn you know? And I used to buy Tums by the box load. I would have them all over the place. You know? Shoes, back pockets, Bible. And one day I said, Lord, I'm really tired of this. Do you think maybe you can heal me of this? And then I took every last single tums that I had in the house, picked them out of my hair, ears, everything, threw it in the garbage can, and ever since then, I have not had any more heartburn. Okay? A couple of weeks ago, okay, Peggy testify, raise your hand so I'm talking to you, Peggy, that Peggy had a stuck finger. It would not come out. It would just stay stuck there. And, and she had to painfully pry it one joint at a time just to get it to open up again. But if she closed her hand, the finger would get stuck again. And, and as I recall, the, the, the lady who prayed for you had never ever pray for anybody before. Is that, is that correct? Did I hear that right? Who was it? That's correct. Where, where are you? What's your name? Jasmine. Jasmine, I want to thank you for being obedient to, to God and coming up to pray for Peggy. Because when she did, over the week, Peggy, show us your hand and your finger that was getting stuck. Look at that. Okay? Thank you. Now, it, it just so happened that I heard about this after the service was done. Um, I think I, I think I was with Pastor Lanny, and I told him about my stuck finger. And he goes, Peggy just got healed about that. I was like, really? Yeah. But here's my finger stuck. It was getting so bad that I was dragging the other two fingers along with it. I had an appointment to see a doctor, and you know we're already talking about surgery. So I, I was on my way home after I talked to Pastor uh, Clark, and, and I said this to God. God, you healed Peggy, didn't you? Didn't you? Well, if you healed her, that tells me two things. You're able to, and you're willing to. I said, God, you think maybe you might be willing and able to heal my finger? I, I want to encourage you for the Encounter Sunday next week to come either as a person willing to go and pray for somebody 
or coming expecting to receive from somebody. Um, Jasmine, I just want to tell you that your simple prayer for Peggy spread. And as I tell this story, I imagine it's going to spread some more. Neither you or I will know how far this went, but someday the Lord will show you how blessed you are for what you did. All right? Thank you so much. Yeah. One other thing I want to discuss before uh, is uh, this morning um, it was brought to my attention that there is a blessing or an anointing for a healing of the emotional kind. That the Lord has seen the hurt that you're carrying and the hurt that is oppressing you and keeping you down and he wants you to know this morning if you are willing he is willing to release you from that did I get that right tender excuse me his tender mercies in other words he's not going to pull out the chainsaw okay his tender mercies let's stand can you help with this portion Now, we, we, we the, the, the uh, ministry team make themselves available uh, for people that need prayer. But listen, I just told you about how God has made a way for you to escape death, for you to be included in the group that ends up in paradise. If you have not made that decision yet and want to, come up and meet me. I'm going to stand up here and wait for you. You come meet me, and we will pray, and we will ask God, God, I don't know how to get there, but God, get me there. And let's see what God does in your life as he frees you from your sin and frees you from all the bondages that have been holding you back. If you have an ailment and need somebody to pray for you, come up to the front. Let us pray for you. Amen? Amen? If the ministry team will make themselves available for me real quick. Thank you. As they come up, chase right behind them. <laughs> if you have a need. And let's see what God will do for you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't pass up the opportunity. God, God is real. God's here for you. Remember, even when I walked around, I said, Lord, heal me, and he started to heal me. If you need prayer because you're sick, don't sit back and say, I got to wait till next week. You come up front right now. There'll be somebody here willing to pray for you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father. Amen. If you're emotionally distressed, don't sit back. His tender, loving mercies are here waiting for you to help you get through this. If you have never said, Lord, I don't know what it's like to say that I believe in you, but I want to believe in you. Come up front and see me. We'll talk about it, and we'll see if we can settle this issue once and for all. Thank you. Thank you. got called into a uh, jail over in Virginia to minister the baptism of the Holy Spirit to about 70 inmates. And as I listened to the presenter set the situation up, it occurred to me that these men 
who were there primarily just to get out of their cells for a little while might need a little bit of encouragement. So we started by simply praying for healing. And in that scenario, the Lord showed up in just such a wondrous way and astonished them with several testimonies of instantaneous healing where they stood. Now, I realize that some folks are re reluctant to let go of the back of the chair. So I just want to say this to you. God's grace can touch you wherever you are. So if you need a touch from the Lord, where you stand, just raise your hand as a token to him, and I want to speak over you. So throw it up, one and two and three and five and seven. All right, Father, I've watched you do this so many times in your tender mercies to us. As they say, reach toward heaven for your touch, I invite you, God the Holy Spirit, the testimony of Christ and the earth today, to touch them where they are. Give them the testimony of your presence moving through their body, releasing their minds, healing their emotions, restoring their physical bodies as testimony of your grace in the earth. And allow them, Lord, like Hilton did with his co-worker. He had told them about the finger that wouldn't work. And when he showed her, she said, really? Yes, really. God really does touch. God really does change. And we invite you, precious Lord, to do that now in the name of Jesus. That name destroys the authority that establishes disorder. And I command these disorders to submit in the authority of my king's name. Now, Lord, let the testimony of what you're doing in this instant reverberate throughout their relationships. Let them be bold enough to stand and declare, this is what Jesus did for me when I reached out in faith to him. Father, I bless those who are here. We pray for those that you're ministering to. We thank you, Father, for the word that was spoken today, for the eternity that is ours. And I speak the blessing of Christ over these and those they represent as we release them now into your future this week. In Jesus' name, amen. We welcome our first-time gifts to the hospitality room out. Uh, it was on the right just as you entered. I'd love to spend a few minutes with you there. There's fellowship and snacks out front. If you need to linger in the presence of the Lord or come to the altar or have Hilton pray with you, we welcome you. You are dismissed. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane, I am a 